second. Welcome to Live, Work, Thrive. I'm Makayla Birmingham, Scary Mommy Executive Producer, and I will be the moderator for tonight's panel, The Shape of You, Raising Girls to Love Their Bodies. Now, when it comes to our kids, the way we view ourselves as women, from the way we talk about fat, fashion, food, can impact how our daughters see themselves. And so tonight, we will sit down with experts who will share strategies for how we can support our daughters to be confident, happy, and healthy in their bodies. Specifically, we will address our body image vocabulary, what phrases we should say or not say, how to talk to your child about the images and beauty standards they may see on social media, crop tops, duck face, face filters, oh my, three of my most hated things. We will dig into this one and how to deal with all of those. Why and how to separate talking about healthy choices from language about body weight, as well, we'll be taking a ton of questions and voicemails from you out there in the audience. And I just wanna mention that while our talk is focused on girls, we will devote some time to the unique and different challenges boys face when it comes to body image, so stick with us. Let's meet our panelists. Tonight we have with us Dr. Charlotte Markey, a leading expert in body image research, having studied image, eating behavior, and weight management for 25 years. I don't know how she's done that because she looks like she's only 30. So, I mean, prodigy, clearly. Um, <laughs> she is professor at Rutgers University, Camden. Her latest book is called Being You, the Body Image Book for Boys. And that is going to be hot off the press April 7th. That's in a couple days. It's the companion to the Body Image Book for Girls, Love Yourself, and Grow Up Fearless. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Dr. Markey. It's a pleasure. Also with us is Virgie Tovar. Virgie is one of the nation's leading experts on weight-based discrimination and body image. She's the author of three books on the topic, You Have the Right to Re Remain Fat, The Self-Love Revolution, Radical Body Positivity for Girls of Color, and a new interactive book coming out in May, The Body Positive Journal. She's also a contributor to Forbes, where she covers plus-size news, weight discrimination at work, and she is the host of the podcast Rebel Eaters Club. Virgie, welcome to Live, Work, Thrive. <laughs> Thank you for having me. And later on in the show, you have to stick with us, especially all you Pelotoners out there. Those of you who have the Peloton in the living room, aka the clothes rack, uh, the Peloton fitness instructor and author of the new book, Speak, Tunde Oyunane, will be joining us. And we will also hear from Michelle Osborne, who is a body image activist and entrepreneur. So before we get started, I have a few quick reminders for our audience. You can submit your questions in the comments wherever you are watching, and we may feature a question later on in the show. Joining our mailing list, it's key, so you don't miss any of our virtual events. Visit scarymommy.com slash liveworkthrive to sign up and stay in touch. You can also now leave us a voicemail. This is my favorite thing. Everyone makes fun of me because I love the voicemail. It's very old school, but the hotline is very hot right now, okay? It's just can't stop ringing. Call us. Tell us what you're struggling with, what topics you'd like to see on the show. Here's the number, 1-800-422-3910. And of course, don't forget to follow Live, Work, Thrive on Instagram, at Live, Work, Thrive. Okay, let's get into tonight's topic because it's a juicy one. Dr. Markey, I think I read a recent study put out by Common Sense Media, um, a survey, that found that the average child has tried some form of a diet by age seven. That was pretty sort of startling. How should parents think about body image from a young age? I feel like it might be too late at age 13 or 14 to start instituting good habits. How can parents of young kids establish a, a strong foundation? Yeah, absolutely. We don't want to start at 13 or 14. We want to start basically the second we bring those kids home. Um, talking about food in morally neutral ways. So we're not talking about food as good or bad, or you can have this, you can't have that. We want to be really careful so that we don't create a lot of forbidden fruit, right? What do kids want, especially as they become adolescents? They want what they can't have. So 
We want to be really careful to not set up that dynamic in our house and make sure that we are keeping food fun. There's no reason to diet or to restrict yourself when you don't feel like there's a lot of rules to start with. That is a great tip. And and Virgie, as an expert in this space, how would you recommend we think about our body image vocabulary at home? Should we think about sort of a a rule or um, sort of a commitment to never making a comment on any body type, shape, appearance? Is that too extreme? Or, you know, how would you answer the question, mom, am I fat? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, my first thought is for someone who's new to this, actually, I encourage people to take a vacation from body and food judgment. Just take that off the off the table. It's one more thing. It's one more thing to think about and worry about, right? So I actually encourage parents to actually stop talking about your body or others' bodies, how you eat or how others eat. It's actually really simple and it's probably the most powerful thing that you can do immediately today to support positive body image, but it's so hard because our culture really does normalize this toxic behavior. And then I think once you feel like you've mastered that, Maybe you can move into working in a vocabulary of building up and of positivity. I think, you know, if a kid asks, am I fat? I mean, the response can kind of depend on how comfortable you feel discussing this topic, right? Like I'm a fat positive feminist. I use the word fat all the time, right? If you're that person, yes, you're fat and that's awesome. And let's talk about what that means. Um, Maybe you're not quite there, which most of us aren't, right? You can respond with something that feels a little bit more authentic or in your voice, like your body is exactly the size it's supposed to be. Um, And one last thing I want to say about that is like creating a moment where you can say, you probably think fat is the worst thing you could ever be. But guess what? Being someone who calls people names is the worst thing that someone could ever be. And I think it's important also to contextualize, right? Like, you know, in the past, we believed that women were bad and people of color were bad and queer people were bad. And we know um, that's not true. And we're just in a moment where we need to be cultural visionaries and be brave. And that's always hard, but we can be like, you know, the heroes that we really admire at school. Um, when we, when we do that for ourselves and the people around us. That's such great uh, language. Your body's exactly the size it should be. I'm writing that one down. Okay. So because so much of our children's perspective, uh, perspective and perception of this is wrapped up in, you know, sort of our own upbringing and maybe trauma in some cases, we asked the scary mommy community to tell us you know what do you hope to not pass along to your girls when it comes to body insecurity um and so one of those uh, members of the scary mommy community left a a voicemail for us actually many of you did Uh, we're going to play one now from ella hunje who describes an insecurity she hopes to not pass along to her daughter here she is Hi, my name is Ellie Hunja, and I live in Los Angeles, California. And I just remember, um, like, sitting down when I was in middle school and just, like, looking down at my thighs and wishing (laughs) that they weren't so big. Um, And I think I internalized, you know, some of my mom's, who's amazing, but some of my mom's body image issues going up and down, on and off Weight Watchers and that kind of thing. And I just hope for my daughter that she will recognize that there's so much diversity in bodies that there's not one normal way for thighs to look or any other part of her body to look. And um, whether she hears the labels too skinny or too fat or too this or too that, I just hope that she would know that the whole spectrum of how we're created as women is beautiful. So that's that's a, a great point. Um, and Dr. Markey, what advice would you have for this caller um, and maybe others out there who had insecurities themselves? How do you break that cycle and not pass on your baggage to your, your kids? I mean, this mom sounds to me like she's pretty on top of this already. That one, she's aware of the fact that maybe some of this came from her own family. And two, she's really cognizant to not pass that on. And I often say, I think women of our generation were like the the Weight Watchers daughters, right? How many of us were dragged to a Weight Watchers meeting or a jazzercise class or something as a child that taught us so really directly 
that these are issues and concerns that we should be focused on. So I think a great first step for all of us is to just know we're not going to do that to our kids. There's more we can do to be proactive, but just not repeating those harms, not dragging our kids to weight loss meetings or to exercise classes when they're six, that's really a huge step in the right direction. I feel like I did the 20 minute workout like at age six or something like that. Probably that was damaging in some way. But anyway, um, <laughs> so on this note, um, you know, this question sparked so much response from our audience. I want to share with everyone uh, a bit of a word cloud or a thought cloud of all of these themes. Um, and so we've put together some of the ones that we heard over and over again. Uh, here it is now up on the screen for you. And I'll just read a few of those. Um, when it comes to what are you insecure about and what is that thing that you don't want to pass along? And many people said weight or skin color, cellulite, body shame, face filters, comparing uh, myself to others, stretch marks, being insecure wearing a bathing suit, uh, stressed about being thin, feeling too tall, another person said, um, thinking they're fat or striving always for perfection. Um, exercising only for aesthetic reasons, not for physical or mental health, um, shame about how, how others perceive them, um, and so it goes on and on. But, you know, I feel like this is just such a great sort of, you know, sampling of, like you said, Dr. Markey, the Weight Watchers daughters <laughs> cohort, right? Um, Virgie, what do you make of this? Is this an example of sort of the collective trauma our generation has experienced? And is there hope for breaking the cycle? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it, I think it is. I think the word trauma is really important. I don't think people understand, for example, that when they're having an instinct towards restricting food or dieting, they're actually triggered. We're, we're taught to code that behavior as I'm inspired, but actually what it means is I'm triggered from the initial trauma of learning that something was wrong with my body and other people's bodies. So I think starting from that really frank place is really great. I think another thing when I talk with parents, I always remind them, this is an opportunity to reparent yourself, not just sort of not pass on harm, you know, this idea that like you can kind of step out of the process, your trauma doesn't matter, you're working through some of this stuff doesn't matter, it 1000% matters. Um, so I always encourage people to sort of like, think about what happened with you, take the time to have the grief over those losses and those that sense of not feeling okay, have the moment to feel angry, and all of those emotions are really, really important. And to remember that, you know, there's this instinct, I think, especially if you're socialized, female to sort of like, you know, almost like be self-sacrificial. This isn't about me. This is about sort of almost like not passing something on. And in actuality, that modeling of reparenting is really powerful and absolutely will impact the environment of your home. I could just That's add to could, that too. Yeah. I, th I think that what I love about raising a daughter is that it is an opportunity to get it right myself, finally. It feels like there's so much more on the line here now. It's not just me and my happiness or my mental health, but it is the next generation. It is my kid. And so I think when you have that extra incentive to get it right, to stop worrying about things that don't matter as much as our culture has told us that they do, then that's pretty motivating. That kind of keeps me working at it. That's a great point. This is our turn. We're going to get it right. They ruined us in so many ways. <laughs> We're damaged goods, but it's not too late. I like it. Okay, so now let's talk about women of color because women of color have unique challenges when it comes to body image that can exacerbate feelings of low self-esteem, exclusion, and you know a lot of this is systemic. Um, let's take a listen now to body activist and mother Michelle Osborne to get her take on how she navigates this with her own daughter. Here she is. My name is Michelle Osborne. I'm a communications professional and a body image activist. I think women of color in general, we're at the bottom of the list when it comes to being the most desirable. So not only do we have to think about how our bodies look, but we have to think about the package we, in, we are in in terms of color. All the different things that society deems as beautiful, especially when it comes to um, Eurocentric beauty standards, 
we are not acceptable. So one of the things is my daughter is half white, half black. So I know she is going to have privilege. And one of the things that I make sure is that my home is a safe space for her. What does that mean? It means we don't talk about dieting. Uh, food is just food here. There's no good foods or bad foods. Um, anytime she wants to talk about anything to do with how she looks or her confidence, it is an open book uh, because I need to make sure that when she is with me, it's a safe space. I cannot control what happens out in the world with her friends, but I can control what happens in our, our space. So I make sure that she feels comfortable in her body Body, that it, she feels reassured, but I also make sure she knows that she has some sense of privilege because she has lighter skin. But what I do teach her is how to use that privilege for good. So Virgie, you've done a lot of work in this space as well. Can you speak to some of these challenges um, that Michelle mentions about being a black woman in a society that favors Eurocentric standards of beauty? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think ultimately, if you think of fat phobia as a source of stress, um, you know, for example, um, you know, racism is also a form of stress. So these things compound, they create outcomes like anxiety, they affect mental health, they affect physical health, right? So the more of these intersections that you're dealing with, the more that these kinds of stressors are adding up, right? And so I think it's important to, um, you know, create practices where I think that safe space idea is really, really important, right? Like create spaces, create practices that can really create, like that can leave opportunities for self-care and to sort of process some of these feelings. But absolutely, you know, like at the end of the day, we are inundated. I was just writing a piece about this, right? Like our visual processing center, which is in our occipital lobe, right? We're just constantly inundated by thin, white, cisgender, able-bodied young people. And it leaves very little room, you know, to build up self-esteem, number one. But in addition to that, like just visually, our brain is being shown this is what's normal. And so if you're not that, your brain is automatically putting out a signal of error, something's wrong, error, even if you have really high self-esteem. So I think these are all challenges. And on the other hand, right, like I think when I think about talking to girls of color, I'm like, but you also have all of these magical, incredible skills, right? You can absolutely speak, like speak about what's happening. You can use the language of what's happening. I remember working with a group of girls and we were doing like a check in and they were like six and it was incredible and I was like okay I'm talking about body image six-year-olds let's see what happens and, one, and during the first person's check-in she was like at school someone made fun of my hair and that's because of colorism and I found it very inappropriate and hurtful and I was like okay um and so I'm like you know this six-year-old is using the language and she's able to articulate her experience rather than internalizing a sense of shame so I think like you know th those are my thoughts on that <laughs> I love this six-year-old. We need to get her on Live or Thrive. Goodness. All right. So let's, I mean, as much as we could talk about that for a whole other hour, we're going to move it along to the other big topic, which is food. Okay. So as parents, we're programmed from birth. We monitor how many ounces of milk did I pump? How many jars of the food did we eat? You're calling the babysitter. Did you drink the whole bottle? How many of this? How many pears? Then culturally, you know, we, many of us are raised by elders who express love with food, more food. You're sad here. Eat, eat some pie. At the end of the day, um, you know, many parents just want their kids to eat a wholesome meal, right? You know, I was in the like, finish your plate generation. Make sure that the clean plate club, that was a thing back in the 90s when I was a kid. Um, how do you talk about healthy eating food choices? without allowing that conversation to cross over into the realm of weight, dieting, restricting foods. Uh, Dr. Markey, I feel like this is a big one because yes, we know that we don't wanna have good foods and bad foods, but when your kid only wants to eat white bread and pasta 24 seven, the, you know, you gotta have some sort of rules here. How do you, how do you monitor or how do you steer them towards any form of balance, which is not what children are good at usually? <laughs> Well, they, they can be better at it than we sometimes give them credit for, I think. And a lot of it has to do with just what's available. So if they really are only eating white bread, you could accidentally forget to buy it. But I wouldn't make a big deal about the white bread. 
Um, so sometimes the language we use in this research is covert restriction versus overt restriction. I would never overtly restrict hardly anything. I mean, for a while, I think in my house, we were kind of anti-soda. The pandemic completely destroyed that um, because that felt like, oh, that's a treat. Let's have some soda, uh, whatever, you know, but at the end of the day, the more, again, we make it forbidden fruit, the more appealing it really does become. And kids are not going to like anything they've been forced to eat. So what you want to do is make options that feel reasonable to you that have nutrients in them available, have them out. I have a neighbor whose favorite trick is just to like kind of put out a veggie tray sometimes when she's preparing food and not say anything about it. And then people wander by and they eat it and she says nothing, right? Now I'm not organized enough to put a veggie tray out in my house. Um, I've never, in fact, perhaps put a veggie tray out in my house, but I think it's a great idea if that's your thing. Um, otherwise, I think generally have available in the home what you want your kids to eat. and. Again, otherwise, it's really hard because we want to have control of something. And most of us as parents learn shockingly early on that we can't control these, these beings that we have brought into our homes and our lives. And they turn it upside down. And we think, I'm showing you my love. And I am creating some control in this chaos by telling you what to eat. But it doesn't work. So you have to just kind of let go of a lot of it. And sometimes my kids eat dinner right before dinner. And it pisses me off because I'm making dinner while they're eating basically a dinner. And I let them do it because they're hungry now. And then I say, well, you have to sit at the table for at least five minutes. And they understand that rule. They talk with me. Maybe they pick at the real dinner. That's it. End of story. The leftovers go in the fridge. Um, we have the resources that I can afford to waste food occasionally or eat leftovers. That's not everyone's situation I appreciate, but a lot of it is just letting go as parents. Wow. So you won't even be like, eh, we're eating in an half an hour. Stop it with the food. You're just like, go ahead. I mean, those. I'll say it. I am a human being. Will I will say. say, it. say okay, okay. So you will, will mention say, that yes. this is a bad idea. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I tell my kids they have bad ideas all the time, but um, <laughs> in age appropriate ways, of course, um, I will say, you know, I'm, I'm currently making your favorite dinner. So do you want to, do you want to wait for that? Or are you really hungry now? And if they say, I'm, I, I really want to eat something now. I just had practice or I just, I barely had time for lunch for whatever reason. I say, all right, fine. Um, all right. So one of the our audience members here has a question that I want to hit to you. Maybe, um, maybe Virgie, you could take this one. What is the appropriate slash least harmful language to use with children who are struggling with emotional eating when they're anxious? Yeah, I mean, I think people um, use the word emotional eating in kind of like a really pathologizing, judgmental way. I'm like, eating is always emotional. Eating is memory. Eating is culture. Eating is, I mean, right. Like I think, um, a lot of people are very quick to see any eating that is not pragmatic or functional, um, or, you know, fuel based exclusively. Um, they're very quick to get really, really afraid in general. Um, the, the landscape around eating between parents and children is characterized largely by terror, um, right? Because we live in a culture where the relationship to food and body is disproportionately focused on disease and death, right? Um, that's really the that's really the container that we're in right now. So I want to say lower the stakes. Um, that's the first thing I want to say. Second, you know, eating is always a, some combination of reasons, right? Like I, I literally, the other day I was doing, teaching this class called food positive parenting. And I was just doodling in my journal, making little pie charts of all the motivations of why I ate that day. I was like, snack one, boredom, availability. Um, it looked good. And then, you know, like maybe snack two or meal, whatever. It's like hunger primarily, but then also it was like delicious. And we all, I mean, I think it's really easy to, in our culture, think that all of us should be motivated by just 
fueling the machine, but our body isn't a machine. All of us are actually making decisions about eating in a pie chart way all the time without even really noticing. And I say like, ultimately, right. That kid is, is engaging in some kind of self-care. Um, so that's how I feel about it. I wouldn't get too worried unless like they really can't do something or, or they're, or they're ending up in like physical pain again and again and again and again. That's the only moment that I would kind of like have a red flag about it. And the last thing I was going to say about that, like one of my friends is a, is a PhD in applied human nutrition. She has two kids and her only rules at dinner time are fill up your tummy and eat a variety of foods. She always puts out all the food that's available for each meal at the same time. So if there's like broccoli and cheese and mashed potatoes and like, you know, some kind of, and like a brownie or whatever, it all comes out at the same time at the beginning of the meal and the kid gets to kind of make those choices. So I think, um, finally for real, I think I, for real, I think like in general, if a child starts to get the idea that certain foods are like off limits or that you are evaluating them as bad when they eat them, that will often lead to binging behavior in general, restriction and binging are like milk and cookies. They're part of the same, they're opposite sides of the same coin. So restriction leads to binging, which often might like be read as emotional eating, especially in a culture that's so weird about food. All right. So you guys are pros. You're like, just figure it out, (laughs) children. I'm making the food. It's your favorite. You know, you got to just come and use your, okay. But in the real houses out there in the world, we got the people who are like, you barely ate the food I made you. And now you want to eat ice cream. I know we don't have good foods and bad foods. Like my daughter used to say, but mom, my dinner area is full, but my dessert area still has space. And I was like, what? It's one area. So what do you say in this situation? Like, I get it. You don't want to have good and bad, but you can't have the child eat one bite of the chicken and then like they don't eat any ice cream or they eat like a whole tub of ice cream. Like, how do you just let them do it? What do you say, doctor? Yeah, I love it. I've since the time my kids were little, I've pretty much let them do that. And um, the amazing thing, I'm not going to declare victory yet because that's a good way to jinx yourself as a parent. Um, But the amazing thing I often see in my home is that I can make cookies and my kids are like, eh, I don't really feel like I'm not hungry. And the reason I think they can do that is because their whole life, it was like, if they wanted a cookie, they could have a cookie. If there were cookies around, that was fine. And if they didn't eat a lot of dinner and they wanted a cookie, that was fine. And so they don't have some of the sort of weirdness that I think most of us in our generation had. And I certainly know I did where it felt like, oh, should I have a cookie? Oh, it's not really good for me. Oh, it's a treat. Oh, I eat too much for dinner. Not enough for dinner. You know, like these things were all related to each other. And it like filled up space in my head for many, many years. And I think we want to raise our kids. So it's just not occupying that space. Right. And, and go ahead. Sorry, I'm rambling. (laughs) No, no, that's okay. I mean, I I got some homework to do with with what you guys are saying, but okay. So here's another question from the audience. My daughter eats really quickly and then always asks for more. I suggest she waits 15 minutes. And if she's still hungry, I give her more. Is this a healthy way for me to handle it? Anybody? Virgie? Yeah. I mean, my thought is like, give her more. Um, I think that like the 50, I think what's really hard, a couple of things coming off of like the earlier question and also this one, it is really difficult. Again, we're in a fishbowl where we're being taught all this like really weird, archaic stuff about food and body that literally dates back from like the 1800s. Like the BMI came into existence in the 1800s. Right? So like, we're in this really weird fishbowl and we kind of can't imagine that the absence of like restriction could lead to anything positive. We believe that like the absence of restriction leads to chaos, insanity, people eating refrigerators and children and streets, right? Like, and at the end of the day, it's actually the absence of diet culture, the absence of restriction that leads to normal behavior. And it's like, we just can't accept it, right? We literally can't accept it. And sure, we're gonna see aberrations and like all that kid wants to do is eat 
all of this stuff very, very quickly for this long, um, but they will learn those like hunger and fullness. I like this. I don't like this. Those lessons are things that we have to learn internally. So I think what's really hard, I mean, to go back to this question, I would say, um, let her eat when she's asking for more, because likely what's happening is the, is the time uh, the time spacing is reading as restriction, which I think is leading to more anxiety. That's my read. What do you think, Charlotte? Yeah, it's tricky, you know, because I do think that there is some good research to suggest that our brains are not always, you know, as on top of it. Like our, we don't process the signals from our digestive system immediately. And that's where this sort of cultural saying about, you know, wait 20 minutes until you swim or, you know, till you eat more, all these sorts of things. There's, there's some basis, there's some actual biological basis to that. But I think Virgie is right. That if you're saying like, wait, 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 that's probably being read as restriction. And I'm bad if I want this, but I really want it. And then again, we don't want to encourage these thoughts of like, well, now I want it even more right? We really want our kids to sort of be able to take it or leave it. Like, am I hungry? Okay. Yeah, I'll have some, right? And I mean, we we joke in my house because it's not always easy to do this in practice. Um, and you really have to relinquish some control. And, you know, uh, the joke is that the kids have multiple dinners in, in our house. It's like they sometimes kind of have dinner before dinner and then they sit down and have dinner. And then, you know, I have a teenage son who's always hungry and he usually has second dinner around like eight o'clock, but he knows he has to make it himself and clean up after himself. And, you know, on the weekends, if he's out with friends, he might have third dinner. And, um, but then he won't eat, you know, the next morning for hours because he ate at night and, you know, cause he's just sort of doing what his body is telling him he needs cause he's growing and he's young and he has a male's metabolism. It's like um, a boa constrictor in nature. Like they eat it yeah. all and then they got like, oh yeah, I'm full. I gotta wait a few hours before I eat again. Got it. Okay. So this is very fascinating. I feel like very interesting, totally requires us to think differently about our mindset. Um, I know my kids are listening right now and be like, see, they said we could eat whatever we want. Um, <laughs> it's going to backfire. Um, so I want to go now to a woman who's had a fascinating journey with respect to body image. Tunde Oyunane is a Peloton fitness instructor and now author of the new book, Speak. I, I mean, when I told uh, some, some Peloton friends that, that she was going to be on the show. Everyone was like, oh my God, we love her. Her classes are so hard. She's amazing. Um, and growing up, Tunde actually struggled with her own body image uh, and self-esteem. Uh, and she describes how it took many years for her to get to a healthy place physically and mentally. So let's hear now what she has to say about how she shifted her mindset to focus on positives rather than losing weight. Here she is. Crystal Hi, my Houston, name Texas. is Tunde Oyunane. I am I don't the author want to pass of Speak. I am the body so thrilled to be here with you today, and I'm ready to get right into it. For so many years, I allowed my focus to be losing weight, and the scale was the dictator in the house. The scale told me if I was doing a good job or I was doing a bad job. If I was doing a good job, I was allowed to enjoy myself and have fun and go out with my friends. If I was doing a quote bad job. And if I gained weight, then the scale told me I wasn't allowed to go have dinner with my friends. I had to stay at home. I needed to work out. At some point between then and now, the journey became much more about all that I gained within the process and less about what I'd lost. I set out to lose weight. I lost the weight. But what I gained was a sense of confidence. I gained a sense of purpose and understanding of my power I allowed myself to remove the scale from the equation and I allowed myself to focus on how I felt. I knew that when I worked out, when I lifted weights, it made me feel stronger. I found that when I released sweat, I felt lighter, freer, better. I decided to focus on what I could control. I could control that feeling. I couldn't control what the scale was going to say. Um, and so ultimately that, that is, that's where the biggest shift in my life came. I mean, I still have that imposter syndrome. I still have that small voice that likes to set her way in from time to time. 
And then I have to come back to my why. I have to remind myself of why I continue to do this. So that was Tunde Oyunane, Peloton fitness instructor and author of the new book, Speak, talking about her own journey. And, um, you know, I feel like this is a, we're now in a time when, I mean, back in the day, you know, the, the sweaty person leading the exercise class was never like an icon. But now we have these fitness, you know, gurus and, you know, influencers who are inspiring and fun and like you know they have these like incredible personalities and we're so obsessed with following them and you know taking the classes and you know on one hand that's great and i listen i need all the friends to come along with me when there's an exercise happening it's like bring the more friends because it's more fun and that's how i really get into it so i'm all for that but um here's a question for you dr markey from our audience my teenage son and daughter both follow athletes and exercise influencers and follow their exercise and diets on one hand i think it's healthy but should i be talking to them about why they are doing it and not to obsess because i feel like you know this could this is like anything you, you got to have a balance right would that be fair to say yeah, absolutely. I mean, we need to be talking with our kids about their engagement with media, period. We know that across the pandemic, um, media screen, social media was life-saving, but we also know that kids' engagement jumped up. So tweens are on screens five hours a day, teens are on screens eight hours a day on average. So we do have to ask what they're doing. This is a significant part of their lives. And if they're following fitness um, or other sort of beauty icons, we really want to try to understand what that's about. There is actually some good psychological research to suggest that some of this quote unquote fitspiration actually does not inspire in all cases that oftentimes what it does is just make us feel inferior and bad about ourselves. Of course, the same could be said for most of social media, depending on what your newsfeed looks like. If you have Virgie in your newsfeed and other people like her, then I look on Instagram and I think like, yes, here are all these people promoting mental health and size diversity and things that I care about. And that makes me feel good. But I'm pretty sure that if I had the Kardashians or a whole bunch of other people whose names I probably don't even know because I'm now officially too old to follow most of popular culture, um, I'm pretty sure that I would feel inferior and bad about myself. It's our natural inclination to compare ourselves to other people. It's human. We don't have to feel bad about doing it, but we have to be aware of how we feel and our responses because we can change the behavior. So we don't have to do it. For sure. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, the pandemic certainly was for fitness anyway. I think it was a bit of a unique example because for those of us who, enjoyed in-person activities with others like i i cycle and i had a whole group of, of folks who would get together in an indoor cycling class we'd, we'd bring our own bikes from home very old school and we would literally be sweating and inhaling all each other's aerosols <laughs> all over the place it was disgusting but it was so much fun and we we had a great time and when COVID hit it was like i am not getting into that sweat box with all of you people to share your aerosols but you know having a person like tunde who's a, who's up there who could like bring it to my own house in a safe fun way i feel like is a great alternative um but you know obviously we want to separate out like the rest of social media which is not always great especially for girls um so so virgie you know what do you think what would your advice be for parents when we're thinking about um you know not only body but you know face filters and you know just the overall sort of um you know picture of beauty i feel like when you're looking at some of these uh images you may not even know the people that you're looking at but it's definitely sending our kids a message and you know how would you talk to your kids about that and i wonder if you're using the same don't restrict model here go ahead look at it do whatever you want and then you're you're gonna like moderate yourself or maybe not that maybe this is the time to be like whoa nelly no don't be looking at this trash what do you say virgie yeah, I mean, I 
love what Dr. Markey said about like, how does it feel? It actually goes back to the themes we've been discussing before, self-trust, right? Like when we allow our kids to like eat in a way that feels good to them, it helps them develop self-trust, which is then going to help them develop their intuition and self-trust in all these other areas. I feel like food is one of the first places that I, as a kid, got gaslit. Are you really hungry? Are you just tired? Like, you know, should you wait? Like, can you make Are you that- thirsty? Maybe you're thirsty. Yeah. yeah. It's like, can you make that that mouthful of banana last an hour? Literally things that I dealt with as a kid, right? And that that undercut all of my other self-trust, right? So like when I'm on social media and I'm starting to feel gaslit, upset, confused, self-loathing, but I don't even know what that feels like because I'm disconnected from my self-trust and from my body signals. What does that even mean? So I think like it really comes down to, I think a few things, right? Like helping them check in with what does it feel like when I'm gaslit? What does it feel like when I'm feeling my self-esteem start to spiral? What does it feel like when I'm in like a fugue state? Like I can't get away, right? (laughs) Helping them create language and understanding of that stuff is really, really valuable. Again, going back to my like amazing six-year-old, like she was just given language, give language, like this is fat phobia. And I know it because I trust my experience. This is ageism. This content is gaslighting me and it was designed to gaslight me or maybe it wasn't, but it is. And that's valid. Um, So I think like encouraging them to check in with their bodies, helping to have like, I mean, I know it's really hard. Like, obviously we don't all have these like beautiful, amazing relationships (laughs) our families. Um, but, you know, insofar as you can, a couple of things that I, that I think are like tools that could be used are one, um, creating a self-care plan when they're in a good head space. Like, what am I going to do? How am I going to know when I start feeling this? What am I going to do? What are my steps? And how do I take my little, how do I do my little aftercare plan? And the other thing is actually, um, I, I did this with uh, my partner, who's uh, obviously not a child, but we did like a personal value sort. You can actually download it for free online. Mind. It's like a personal value sort. And you can do a personal value sort with your kids and say, like, well, if you know, figure out what your top values are, and it's the content you're watching aligned with those values. And then they just have that thing. People love doing this value sort. Um, so, so, like, you know, they can have that as sort of like, a guiding map of like, is this aligning with my values? Do I not believe, do I believe in like all this stuff that these people are promoting? Because if not, then I got to be careful about what I'm doing here, you know? That's a great tip. And on that note, I want to, I got to talk about crop tops because it's like my big hot button issue right now as a mom. There's no bottoms to the tops anymore. It's only a crop. March, February, it's freezing. Every top is a crop. But what I think that sometimes girls especially take from what they see on social media is this need that everything's sexy all the time, sexy, sexy, sexy. We got to stand in a certain way. We got to stick our tongue out now when we take a picture. The children cannot smile in a normal way anymore. I'm telling you. It's like, it's, it's a crisis. So Dr. Markey, how do you like I, I wish we all had a woke teen who was like, oh, well, that's, you know, sexualization of, of young bodies. And like, I don't agree. But I feel like what they see is like, oh, well, I see that. So now I want to put that same sort of style out into the world. Um, how do you say like, you know what, maybe today not a crop top with a mini skirt with the, the boobs hanging out? Like, is that again, like, just let them do it and they'll figure it out on their own? Or do you have any rules? Well, let my let me start by saying that I feel you on this one. I have been uh, looking at dresses for an upcoming dance with my fourteen year old, and the sort of girly part of me is enjoying it. I will admit, but one of the ones she recently showed me that she really liked, I actually found myself blurting out, "Is that a bathing suit?" <laughs> because. <laughs> It looked that small to me. Um, And I did take a step back then. I don't recommend blurting that out, but I do think it's also important to appreciate that we're human. We're going to have gut responses and that's okay. So then I took a step back and I said, okay, well, um, that wouldn't be my first choice. Are there other ones you'd like to show me? (laughs) Um, But here's the bigger point I really want to make. As girls grow up and they're going through puberty, it's somewhat normal for them to want to experiment with showing 
off their bodies. People around them are doing it. It gets them attention. It's reinforced. It's encouraged culturally. It doesn't mean that they're sexually promiscuous. It doesn't necessarily mean much of anything. So as parents, I'm not going to ever say like, oh yeah, just let that one go. Not as loose with this as I might be with food, but I think there's um, an appropriate way to approach it. And to also keep in check, what are we worried about, right? So I think often as parents, when we're worried about what our kids are wearing, especially our daughters, let's be honest, we're worried that other people are going to objectify them. We're worried that they're going to be sexualized. We might even be worried they're going to be harassed or abused or raped or even just not taken seriously. And we don't want any of that for our kids. But here's the thing. We could actually explain that in developmentally appropriate language and say, like, listen, I see why you think that that's cute. I know a lot of people are wearing that. My thought is if you're wearing that, I'm, I'm, I feel some concern as your mom about how people will look at you or how they might treat you. And that makes me nervous. And I do find that if you don't necessarily say, so you will never wear that, but you put out these sorts of ideas like, well, is this how, you know, if people are going to see you that way, do you have any concerns about that? Or, um, and you might want to also add in, not that that makes it okay, not that they should see you that way, not that that's appropriate, but realistically, that might be the perception. Um, then you can leave it up to them to a certain extent. Say, so, so then what's your choice going to be? And when it goes to the, the dance dresses, it's like, okay, well, we're going to order, a, we're going to order a few. This seems to be an MO for kids these days. You can try them on. And if you really like it, then okay. But I want you to think about what you're saying by your appearance, because people will read something, whether they should or not, doesn't always matter. Sounds so much better than my, no, you're not going to wear the hoochie mama shirt to school, uh, which is what I say, which is probably not the appropriate language, but I'm going to work on that. Everybody record what she just said, replay that because it was excellent verbiage for all of us. Um, but you know, we all want to say what you just said at times, I think. So I, I don't want you to think that like, oh, I'm doing this all wrong. I don't want other moms listening to think like I'm doing this all wrong. I mean, keep in mind some of what I try to do as a parent is informed by studying this for 25 years. I mean, I should get it right occasionally. This is what I do yeah, for a living. I mean, yes, girl, you 25 years. I expect you to be perfect in this crop tops dilemma that we're in right well, now. Well, and I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I still mess it up too sometimes. But, you, you know, I think, um, again, what are we worried about? Later, tell me where you got the dresses because I'm going to be buying a dress too uh, in a month and I'm dreading this whole thing. Yes. Um, anyway, let's move it along because we have to tackle eating disorders, which is a topic on many people's mind. And so, um, Virgie, can you just kind of put this into context for us and, and sort of give us a couple of, let's say, warning signs that a parent might notice that could indicate that there is disordered eating going on and and sort of what to do as a first step? I mean, I want to say to begin with, like we live in a culture that normalizes disordered eating. We're in a disordered eating culture. Um, so it's like, I just kind of want to, I mean, it's, I know it's, it, I don't want to confuse you, but I just kind of want to put out there that like, you know, the well is, so we're in, again, the fishbowl, this is the fishbowl that we're in. Um, I very early on in my career, I mean, as someone who, had an undetected eating disorder who restricted food and just thought she was being healthy for 20 years. Um, you know, I think it's important to understand that like there is, there's sort of this idea that there's a spectrum of restriction and some restrictions. Okay. And some restriction isn't okay. I think what's important to understand is like, this is not, I mean, this, this, this spectrum is really, really complicated. Um, so like in my instance, for example, I couldn't tell when I'd gone from regular dieting to full blown, basically anorexia. I literally could not tell the difference. And especially as a higher weight person, 
the anorexia was being encouraged and prescribed to me by the doctor. So I think I kind of want to take this, this question as like a higher weight person or for someone who has a higher weight kid to begin with, right? Like eating disorders get invisibilized. If you have a child of color and if you have um, a, a child who's red as masculine, if you have a fat kid, um, your doctor is likely prescribing anorexia if your child is a higher weight child. And I would say like, you need to protect your kid from that. Um, so for me, it's like, it's not necessarily about sort of warning signs. It's like, the, like, the culture is a big red flag to me, the culture of how we talk about food, the culture of how we think about food and the ways that we completely equate body size with food consumption um, is all, all disordered. And so for me, it's like, you know, creating a child who trusts their body, creating ideas and policies and language around how you live your life that is not about their size, right? Like if you have two kids, one is a larger bodied kid, one is a smaller bodied kid, do not do different things with that larger bodied kid than you would like, don't have different meal plans for them, for example. And this is the thing, right? You might have a doctor who's telling you to do this. So I'm, I could go on and on and on, but I'm just going to, that, that's kind of, I know it's theoretical, but like, that's, that's what I want to leave people with. <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, so, Dr. Murky, we have a couple questions from the audience uh, here, and I want to just uh, hit you with those. So, this one says, I gained a bit of weight over COVID and have been on Noom since January. I have lost weight and my daughters, almost 9 and 12, see me weigh food, and I tell them about what each color is. How can I make sure that I am not doing this in a damaging way to their self-esteem or confidence? Yeah, so I uh, would would personally um, refrain from um, displaying any sort of dieting behaviors in front of kids. Um, I think that you know we, as we said at the beginning, we are children of the Weight Watchers generation. We are Weight Watchers daughters. Um, we don't necessarily want to create. Um, a generation that feel like they were new kids or, or I don't even know what all the other names are, paleo kids or, or whatever it might be. Um, kids should not feel worried or concerned about food. They shouldn't be tracking it. They shouldn't keep, keep it organized in their mind really in any way, aside from like, I like it. It tastes good. I have it in the house often because it's cultural or we like it. Um, so I would be, I would just be really careful about, um, what we're doing in front of our kids when it comes to managing food. And I think also this is another opportunity to treat ourselves well, to get sort of our own house in order and how we think about these things, um, not just for our own benefit, but also for our kids' sake. And so, and, and on that topic, Dr. Markey, do you, do you have any sort of, um, I know you mentioned that there are sometimes differences between boys and girls when it comes to body image and uh, potentially eating disorders. Do you want to maybe just give us a, a little bit of insight there in terms of, you know, if you're a parent, what might be something to dig deeper into? Yeah. So what's, I think, really interesting and um, often missed is that, you know, when girls are engaging in disordered behaviors, we tend to recognize them more quickly, not often right away, but somewhat more quickly because we sort of have um, stereotypes about what this looks like, right? It may be some form of purging, or it may be skipping meals, or it may be um, just restricting. And in terms of boys, often, although not always, but often those behaviors when they are really dissatisfied with their bodies or concerned about their body image, the behaviors can look quite different. And so they can look like going to the gym a lot with their friends, and they can look like um, a lot of protein powder shakes at, or smoothies. They would never call them shakes, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, you know, cutting out dessert. And on the surface, these things might look healthy, like you're exercising and you're not having sweets. 
I'm like an amazing parent. Look what's going on here, right? And these are the sorts of things, as I think Virgie was indicating, like a doctor might recommend, you know, cut out dessert, right? Um, except they're not necessarily healthy because they're often the manifestation of a lot of stress about food and body. And so, you know, if you truly are raising an athlete and they really are into their sport and need to exercise or something a lot for that, um, I mean, I guess, okay, but I, I would remind us that most of us are not ever going to be in that position. Most of our kids are not going to like, you know, play for the NBA or anything. Um, and for the rest of us, it's like, well, how much time do we think our kids should be spending at the gym? Like I, you know, I want my kids to hang out with their friends, do well in school, you know, talk to me for like between five and eight minutes a day, it's usually about what I get, um, you know, uh, other things, right? Maybe clean the room once a year. Like there are other things that should fill their time. And um, again, the biggest issue is what's going on inside. And a lot of times it's, it's really unhealthy. It's really sad. And we miss it because we're reinforcing the, oh, look at how big your muscles have gotten. Um, and, and that's cultural, you know. And also nobody wants those protein bins in their kitchen because they don't fit in any cupboards. They're too big. My husband has all these collagen, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what it is. I'm just like, really with these containers? That's really my problem with it, space. <laughs> well, you know, um, the containers are one thing, but if I might interject, you know, supplements are not regulated. It's a huge multi-billion dollar industry. You don't necessarily know what you're getting. I don't really understand where the myth came from because it truly is a myth that boys and men especially have just globbed onto that they need more protein. They don't. It's probably the one thing that they actually are completely in sync with any sort of dietary recommendations, right? Almost everyone in developed countries gets enough protein. So you don't need protein powder. You can buy it. It's expensive. You can ingest it. It might not be harmful. And then you will excrete it because you don't need it. So it's actually just kind of a waste for most people. There you go, people. You heard it here first. You're just peeing out that powder that's taken up the space in the kitchen. And it's disgusting. I mean, have you tasted this stuff? Blech. Who wants that? Um, anyway, so, okay, we have lots of questions and we have three minutes left. So I'm going to get just to a few. We'll do them super quick. So Virgie, how do you handle comments about your kid's body by family and other people? You go to grandma's house and then they're like grabbing the stomach and like, oh, so chubby or whatever it is. Like, do you do, you do a throw down with grandma in the living room or do you do it in front of the child? Do you do it later in private? How do you handle this? Right. It's so frustrating because like literally everything we're advocating is like against anybody's normative concept of like interacting with this human being. I think what's hard, right, is like, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, there's some level of discomfort either. And it can be, I think, right, it can be like really overt. Like if you're a very frank, straightforward person, just be like, we're not doing that anymore. Um, or if you're sort of like, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit like, ugh, like I'm a little bit more conflict diverse, actually, even though I talk loud. Um, you know, I might be the person who's like, okay, we're 15 minutes and we'll go to one out of every three things they invite us to. Um, and I might sort of be like, if you're having a moment where you start to feel uncomfortable, here's our game plan. You can like come to me, you can go to the bathroom, you can go to the car, here are the keys, you know? So like, I mean, obviously if they're like three, don't do that. But I think there are ways that you can kind of work around that. But in general, I think you do need to like protect your kids from that. Um, yeah. Good advice. Go to the car. That's the safe space. I do the bathroom. Um, Love that. Or the bathroom. I mean, yes, always, always things to do in there. Um, okay. So another question for you, Dr. Markey. Um, she says, how would you suggest promoting positive self talk rather than going direct to negative? I'm finding it shocking that at seven, my daughter talks badly about herself at times. I think we have to model some of this and it's super uncomfortable because it's not the way that we were brought up. So we were brought up um, in the, 
you know, oh, I'm so fat. No, you're not. Oh, but I am. But you know, you're not like, you know, generation. This was like a source of bonding for women. And it has been for decades. And we have to put the complete kibosh on that. We cannot do that. It's completely maladaptive. um, And we don't want to model that. And instead, we can pivot. And on the one hand, if we're going to say something, keep it positive. On the other hand, just talk about people's appearance less, right? Just focus on other things that we value, right? So your seven-year-old who's upset about her stomach or something, I think it's okay to say, listen, honey, you're growing. All of our bodies continue to change for the rest of our lives. Your stomach's not going to look like that in a year. I'm sorry you find it upsetting right now. Um, but we all just keep changing. My stomach grew a lot when I had you, and that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Um, and then just, you know, switch to, I think you have a really cool sense of humor. I love that joke you just told me, or you've become such a great artist, or I love that you are loving to read. You know, there's just so many other things we can spend more of our energy focusing on. And I think truly we all want this for our kids. We all want them to be well-rounded people with interests and um, desires that are much more than just about how they look. That's such great advice. And unfortunately, we're out of time. I have like 10 more questions I want to ask both of you. Maybe we're going to have to do a part two because I feel like we just scratched the surface. But you guys were so, I'm going to say inspiring. I don't know if that's allowed. But yes, you were inspiring. (laughs) um, Because I think we really all have to reboot the way we were taught. And I like what you just said. I'm so fat. No, you're not. Like I can literally remember like my aunts talking to each other at the pool party. Like, oh, I don't want to put my bathing suit on. You look fine, girl. You look fine. It's how we were raised, and it's a lot to undo that. So we're almost out of time. I want to let you know our next episode of Live, Work, Thrive will be on May 10th, and it's called Where Did All the Happy Kids Go? Mental Health in the New Normal. Remember in our day, we were actually happy running around, or so we thought? Um, Join us by signing up at scarymommy.com slash liveworkthrive. Also, call our hotline. My favorite thing, you guys, call the hotline. It's the old-fashioned phone. You call. You talk. It's like what we used to do back when people were in Weight Watchers. Okay. 1-800-422-3910. Call us. Tell us what's up. So thank you to our incredible panelists, Dr. Charlotte Markey, body image expert. Pick up her latest book called Being You, the body image book for boys. Comes out this week. She also has one for girls. I feel like I need to get both of these. Even though I don't have a son, I'm going to read it anyway because I want to soak up all this information. Uh, Virgie Tovar, author of the new interactive book, The Body Positive Journal. Got to get that one too. She's also the host of the podcast, Rebels Eaters Club. Check it out while you're doing your folding. You got to listen to a good podcast. All right. Also, we thank Tunde Oyunane, Peloton fitness instructor. Tunde, full of energy, joined us earlier. She is author of the new book, Speak. You can pick up a copy right now. And Michelle Osborne, love her page. She has the best videos. And if you like reels, Michelle is, is bringing us all the inspiring content. Body image activist. You can follow her on Instagram at Uncomfortable Bliss. So, Good night, everyone. We got to go. We're even like three minutes over time because this was such a jam-packed session. Have a great night. Uh, Let's aim to set aside our own body baggage and set girls on the right path to body confidence and boys. Let's say yes to modeling healthy living and keep the scale out of that equation. We can be the first to empower our girls and our boys to love their bodies so that they will live, work, and thrive. Good night, everyone.